Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Sarah and today I'm joined by a special guest, Pim Johnson. Pim's a carb addiction coach and she's going to talk to you about how food addiction starts, the biochemistry and psychology of food addiction, but most importantly, what you can do if you do have a problem with food addiction, especially carbs. So I'll hand you over now. Well, thank you so much. I do appreciate you having me on here. So yeah, I, I do specialize in carb addiction, but I'm also a nutritionist. I have a master's degree in nutrition and a bachelor's degree in biomedical science. And I'm double I'm a double certified life coach. So that's pretty much what I'm using. I'm using my scientific background to learn about how addictions work in the brain and how to change that on a neurological level. So we're actually rewiring the brain to not be addicted anymore. So that's, yeah, that's me. Okay, great. Because... Well, I work in addiction as well, but not the same as you. And food addiction is one of the most difficult ones to conquer. So why why would you say that um, this is the case? And do you even agree with that? Um, that's quite funny that you bring that up because I recently was in contact with a woman who is a former heroin addict. And she says it was easier to quit heroin than sugar. So I think you're on to something. And I think the main reason for that is that we can't just quit eating. And the act of eating is one of the triggers for many people to want to continue eating and they want to eat the things that give them the most pleasure. So I think that when once we start eating, the brain just associates that with an amount of pleasure, an amount of dopamine in the brain that it wants when we're eating. So when we're not giving it that, if we're eating something that isn't as pleasurable, we're going to get the cravings to actually start eating all the carbs and all the things that will give us that pleasure. So we're sort of triggering ourselves every time we eat, which you don't do if you are on some sort of heavy drugs or whatever. Then if you're staying away, you're staying away and you'll be fine. Oh, definitely. I've um, heard that before. People find it much easier to give up cocaine and cigarettes. But when it comes to food, it's different. And also, in your opinion, when do you think food addiction starts? or carb addiction, would you say that, because um, I would say the people I work with, when they do have these kind of eating issues, it's um, junk food, I would say, whereas you're um, going to hone in a little bo bit more and maybe tell us about sugar and carbs specifically. But when would you say the problem actually starts? I think the problem for those people who are wired to get addicted to foods, I think the problem can start very early. I have like my earliest memories are from when I was five or six years old. And my mom is a night owl. So she was always sleeping in. And I know that I was up much earlier than her. And I would be climbing on the chairs in the kitchen to check if she had hidden any cookies in the top cupboard because I knew where she was hiding them. Um, I don't think she ever found out. But I would find those cookies and I would take a couple I, I didn't dare take more than a couple because then she would obviously notice and I would just eat them before she woke up. And that's kind of an addictive behavior mm -hmm. uh, in a little kid. So I think it can start really early. And if you're someone who's grown up and eaten a lot of processed carbohydrates, then you have gotten this uh, reward system going. So what is happening is when you're eating especially processed foods, because it's not natural, we're not supposed to digest and enjoy food as much as we do with the processed foods. So what's happening is that you will get an unusual amount of dopamine being released in the brain, which we're not made for having. So it would be a lot more dopamine than there would ever be if you were eating any foods that were natural. So the brain is going to perceive that as that something is wrong and we have too many dopamine receptors. The response is too high. We don't need to have that many dopamine receptors and it will start to downregulate them to to get us to be at a level that is more normal. But the problem with that is that now we had this huge response, we're going to crave that huge response and we can't get that again because we don't have the amount of receptors to get that response. So that's when we start chasing the high. That's what we call tolerance. So we just keep looking for more and more and more and we want to eat more carbs and more stuff. And we keep eating even when we're not enjoying it because we're looking for that reward that we're never going to get again. 
Okay, well, that's really um, interesting because I think a lot of people um, may have the beginnings of food addiction or slight food addiction and it, it delves into binge eating as well. So f yeah. first of all, so that people don't think it's all doom and gloom, um, you've helped a lot of people overcome it. Uh, and just because something's difficult, it doesn't mean it's impossible. And I think I said it more so people don't beat themselves up over it. So maybe do you want to start with the things that people shouldn't do or the worst ways to try and tackle carb addiction or food addiction and, and and why people who try very hard or do their best or think it's willpower or whatever you know maybe um tell us a bit about the the wrong approach or the wrong ways yeah i, I mean the worst approach which i think most people are yeah. trying which i did as well so i'm not exempt but is we we think that the only solution is to use willpower and we're going to force ourselves to not touch it and we, some i mean some people put locks on certain cupboards and tell their spouse to hide the key because they don't want to touch that stuff um so we try to put ourselves in some sort of prison where we don't have access to those things but all that does is that it doesn't help your mental health you're just going to go about in the world and being scared of foods and i don't think that is a healthy state to be in but what I did and what many people do that will just make the addiction a lot worse is that we try to use willpower and we are putting so much into it and it feels so bad. And then we just give in. And what that does is that we feel so bad before we give in that it feels awful. And then we give in and the pleasure is just like, it's magnified compared to what it would be if you just ate whatever you craved from the beginning. And this creates an additional neural pathway, which tells you that when you're feeling really bad, then it's going to feel really good to give in. So whenever you are using willpower, that is another trigger for you to actually give in to the cravings. And that just perpetuates that neural pathway. So now you have an additional neural pathway that is even worse that makes you feel even more addicted and more obsessed with eating those kind of foods. So that's probably the worst thing that I can think about that people are doing. Then we have things like, um, if you go on any, you know, a magazine or you're watching any YouTube videos and people would just say, I'll oh, eat some ice cubes or go walk around the block or do whatever. That can work for some people for a very short period of time usually. I don't think it's bad, bad in terms of making your addiction worse, but it's not helping you because it's a distraction. So you're just distracting yourself and you're not going to be able to distract yourself all the time. So it's not something that's going to work long term. OK, so we talked uh, that it's about it from a biological basis and you've mentioned carbs several times. And uh, just to interject about the carbs and the serotonin and the oxytocin, do you think there's also an emotional component that there's something missing in somebody's life as well? Or, or do you think it's just purely carbs? Because, I mean, you can people like fatty and carb food together, but they don't really like just... Okay fatty food um, or maybe they do and c can people get addicted to fruit or something like that so maybe just to say what else is involved yeah well, I think if you had never touched any sort of processed foods I think you would struggle to be a properly addicted to fruits however when you're already addicted to you know processed foods in any form then when you try and cut that out it you usually do something I call an addiction swap. Yeah. And that could be with other foods like fruit. It could be alcohol. It could be cigarettes. It could be anything that like you just pick that up instead to get that dopamine hit. And that might work. I couldn't get addicted to fruit because it doesn't give me enough pleasure to actually feel like I want it. But I could still continue eating a lot of fruit just to try and hit it but I wouldn't really miss the fruit if it was gone because I wouldn't crave the fruit specifically um so what was the other part of the question um uh, it was about um fat addiction because normally it's yeah um, we'll kind of get to the foods um, in a moment, but I think I, I um, kind of asked two questions at once that I think a lot of people, it's the uh, fatty and the sugary foods together 
even yeah. though it's the carbs that we want, but nobody just eats a piece of bread with nothing on it or just a bowl of rice. So there's more to it than just the, the carbs alone. I'm not defending them. I, you know, a lot of people say it's sort of sugar and flour, but it must be more, there's, there's other things as well uh, about the actual foods. And I think, you know, you might want to say what your particular trigger foods were and what your clients ones were and i'm sure lots of people will um uh, relate to it yeah so for me it was always sugar i could eat brown sugar with a spoon like oh, okay. i really liked that <laughs> and it sounds insane it wouldn't have been my preference some sort of fat included with the sugar would have been you know perfectly fine and probably tasted better but if there was nothing else i was perfectly happy to eat brown sugar with a spoon if i had that White sugar, not so much because it doesn't have a lot of taste. But what I see in general when, I, when I'm talking about carb addiction, I'm actually talking about the processed food, processed carbs. So there's almost always for most people some amount of fat in there. It's very often bread, obviously with the butter on. Mm -hmm. um, another, com another common one is actually uh, like peanuts and chocolate in combination. Oh, absolutely. Peanut butter is terrible. Yeah. Nutella <laughs> yeah. is another one that people get addicted to. Yeah. And I don't know what's up with the peanuts, but I have had a stupid amount of clients who have been addicted to peanuts in some form as well, preferably with the sugar, but even without it, just peanut butter or just peanuts, which is a little bit odd. But maybe that's the thing in the US. Um, ice cream is a big one, but anything, if you think like... We have food scientists for a reason. They're putting together the perfect combination of fat and sugar. And the sweetness has to be really balanced because too much sweetness will put most people off. Too little will just not be exciting enough. And they need to get it right. And then a little bit of salt on top of that. And bam, you have a product that most people will like. I'm an outlier when it comes to sugar. I've always been drawn to extremely sweet things like white chocolate, meringue, marzipan, those kind of things. But most people are not. So most people would be in the camp of, you know, cheesecake or donuts. They, they are the best things. Or pizza, you have, you know, you have the bread, you have the fat, you have the flavors, you have all, all these things in that combination. So those are the most common things. And I don't think, I'm calling it carb addiction, because if you cut out the carbs of that, let's say you take the pizza without the base, most people be like something's missing. It's not that interesting anymore. So that's why I'm talking about carb addiction. But what it really is, is processed food addiction in some way. Because as, as we mentioned before, very few people are going to be addicted to fruit. Even if fruit nowadays is a lot sweeter than it was, you know, 100 or 200 years ago. Yeah, the bliss point, I think it's called, isn't it? The, mm. uh, that turns us on and just blows yeah. our dopamine receptors uh, out of the window. Because I think now you've sort of begin to touch on what can people do about this problem because it's fixable. And say if somebody wanted to get started or wanted some guidelines or wanted to maybe understand your approach, because obviously I know you and like and trust you and they might want to understand why, you know, why would I send people to you or why, you know, if I had a problem, which I don't, why would I go to you? So mm -hmm. maybe you want to outline the process because it's something that I would say of all the addictions I work with, it's the most common and the most serious and also people hide it as well. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, I've, I've been doing a lot of hiding in my days. Mm. <laughs> Like going to the shop, buying two chocolate bars, trying to eat one as quickly as possible so I can get rid of the wrapper before I get home. So it looks like I'm just eating one. Yeah, well, hopefully the wrappers <laughs> and the, the carnage afterwards, the boxes is a big thing for people, whether it's, you know, because it's evidence of the feast. Yeah. But yeah you know it's like another thing it's any addictions lonely and people think seem to think they're the only person that's eaten a cake out of the bin or eaten their own kids easter egg five times and bought had yeah. to rebuy it so there's a lot more to it than you know just um a pure sort of chemical addiction so maybe you want to talk about how you work and and what what you do yeah so there are two 
components to it. One is the emotional component, which is the one that I'm focusing on most. So one step that we're always doing is that I teach all my clients to process emotions, because if you can process emotions and a craving is an emotion, by the way, if you can process a craving and you can allow yourself and accept that you're going to have a craving without just going and reacting and eating as a response to that craving, then you're not going to have this problem anymore. So that is a huge part of what I do. The other part is obviously the awareness, because if we don't know what we're doing, you know, uh, most people have been like, I'm just going to eat two cookies. And then they sit with an empty whole cookie wrapper in their lap and they have no idea how they disappeared. If we don't know what's happening, then it's going to be hard to stop that. So we all, I always start with teaching the habit loop. So that's you have to be aware of what your triggers are. So that could be walking into the supermarket, watching someone eat, smell some fresh bread, maybe uh, watch someone eat uh, whatever it might be, going past the vending machine at work. It could be anything that is a trigger. So we need to be aware of what's triggering us. So if we're aware of that, we're like, okay, now it's going to happen. We know, and then we can do the work. When you're triggered, you're always going to have a thought. And I have clients who think they don't have any thoughts, but there was always a thought, and they're usually very, very simple. So if I go to the supermarket, I go in, and I think, hmm, it would be nice to eat something nice that could be it could be as vague as that and then I start looking for all the things like is there some chips here or maybe chocolate ice cream and my brain is already searching for what that nice thing is going to be so that's that could be a trigger as well and just that little thought and then you're going to notice that you have like a physiological response in your body which is the craving so for me, it's always, I'm, I'm a typical dog. I start to salivate and I get like tension in my jaw. And then I also get like tension the whole way down where the food would go. And it's like really tense and it's pulsing a little bit. That's how it feels in my body when I have a craving. And that is the part that I need to learn to process. As in, I need to allow myself to just feel this physical sensation in my body and then not go and buy or eat the thing that I was triggered to want. And when I can sit with that, when I can be okay with it and truly accept that I have cravings, they're just something, this just like a, a series of chemical reactions happening in my body is nothing that is compulsive. It's just uncomfortable. When I manage to finally accept that that is just what's going to happen, the cravings will go away. It's like magic. And until you accept it, you're probably going to resist it and then they're going to keep coming up or not go away, which is okay. You can still sit with it. It's just like going to the gym. You have to start somewhere and you might have to start with a half kilo dumbbells or whatever and slowly build up. So the more repetitions you get in, the more times you're practicing this, the quicker you're going to get there. So one of the things that I do with all my clients is that I, I have them allow 100 cravings because I'm pretty certain that once they've done it 100 times properly, they're going to be there. This is not going to be a problem anymore. They have reprogrammed their brain. They have created a new neural pathway, which will be the one that is now an autopilot that you will go to. So you don't have to think about it and do this for the rest of your life. It might come back if you have something happening in your life, you know, someone you love pass away or you get fired for, from your job or something major your brain might revert back to the old neuron pathway because it's just like drawing on everything that it can to make you feel better. But most of the time, you're not going to have to even think about it after that. Oh, and that's really interesting on two points. So the first one is I'm very much into this, that our minds are not just in our heads. And you mentioned about the craving being very physical and mm. other people have said that. And the it's not just they want something in their head. They actually need to satisfy an uncomfortable itch or tick or feeling or whatever physically. And people who've never had an addiction don't really understand that concept of how it's the entire body screaming for something, not just a thought. And also yeah. by 
bio biochemistry, like you said, is very um, conservative. It doesn't like wasting pathways or enzymes mm. or membrane or whatever. So as soon as you're not using a pathway anymore, it's going to think, OK, well, let's put this to better use. So, so when you work with your clients, do you ever do anything where you encourage them to re replace whatever this dopamine hit or addiction was with, with a new habit and behavior? Or does that just happen naturally when you work with them? Um, that's uh, on a case by case basis. I like them to just learn to be okay with having a craving and not doing anything because I find that that is most useful in the world because we can't always replace it with something. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like I need to walk around the block and someone once said, can I go and just have a hot bath every time I have a craving? And I'm like, how many cravings a day do you have? Do you want to hop in a bath all the time? Do you have time for that? It doesn't seem like a really good solution to me. But what I do with some clients to get a little bit of dopamine is that every time they have a craving, we create a different reward. So some some of my clients have had like um like a glass jar, and every time they have a craving, they get to put like um a glass bead in there or something. And you see it growing over time. So every time you have allowed yourself to have a craving, you get to put that in. And it will, I mean, it sounds silly, but the brain still perceives that as a reward because it want that jar to be filled up. So it, it, it could be anything that you feel a little bit like, oh, that would be fun. I can do that. The and jar thing is really good because it yeah. shows somebody how much progress they're making. Because a lot of people mm. think, you know, we're so negative and we can't help it. Oh, yeah. how we're wired. When if you have a glass, a jar full of all these beads um, building up, you can see how many times you conquered the problem. And uh, we know, yeah. and it's reinforcing that you are doing it right and all the other things which uh, are important in moving forwards. Uh, and also when it comes to working with people, do you have any particular way of eating in mind for them? Or do you, how do you manage? Because the problem with, with carbs are that they, they come, you know, in a sort of healthier form. And mm. then obviously there's pizzas and donuts and stuff like that. But then there are people that like baking their own bread or they grow potatoes in their allotment, you know, Without sort of, I know it would be a case by case, but what's your thoughts on a way of eating that's helpful for people? Um, in the past, I work with people that had like any sort of dietary background. It, it's not an issue as such, but the the lower carb you are, the easier it's going to be because we have, I say, we have two types of cravings. We have physiological cravings and we have psychological cravings. So I'm working mostly with the psychological part. Mm -hmm. The physiological is more, you know, when you get swings in your blood sugar and I, I call it a carb hunger, which is like a false sense of hunger because you're eating so many carbs that your blood sugar might drop. And I don't know about you, but if I'm eating a lot of carbs the next day, I'm going to be ravenous. I'm going to want to eat all day long because clearly I'm very sensitive and I think that's the case for most people just look at anyone eating a high carb diet they they want to eat six times per day because they get hungry six times per day so that's going to make it a lot harder to do but it's not impossible but nowadays I'm mostly working with keto and carnivores that are struggling to stay on that type of diet and that makes that part so much easier to deal with and we can just focus on the psychological aspect completely because most of them as long as they stay with the diet that's not going to be an issue and when they go off if they have you know if they fall off the wagon for a second they have something that they know that they didn't want to eat then we know that they're going to have more cravings and then they just the homework for them will be to deal with those cravings and just they get more opportunities to practice it's as simple as that. Oh, definitely. I think um, mixing keto and carnivore with a carb addiction is a really horrific combination. And I think some people who make accusations about keto and carnivore and health, they failed to um, compute this big population of people that cheat because it's a catastrophic cheat if you if if they do and it can I've had people they can go off for weeks and weeks and weeks and then yeah. go back onto keto and it, and it is something that I think like you said people think it's like a prison sentence but that's how you feel when you are addicted and then as soon as it's gone away you just actually forget about the thing because I've been addicted to things in the past and it's something now I just think I don't even understand how but at the time the idea of somebody taking it away from me was just so 
terrible and i think a lot of it's the, it's the thought of being without the thing also yeah. can be problematic as well and yeah absolutely on that you know because there are obviously people who think you know if it was that easy we'd all stop all of our addictions so there's obviously something to do with um some kind of secondary gain or um some fear of letting go of, of this friend mm -hmm. or this 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 thing that's comforting um, so what what do you do in um, for people who are who can't even get who who really struggle with with the first hurdle? Uh, I think it's all about not restricting and not going to a place where you say I'm never going to have carbs again because mm -hmm. that's not very useful. The brain will just go into straight panic mode. And I was when I learned how to do this, I think I spent about three and a half, four years, something, just planning for when I was going to eat. So I was happy to just be in control because that was a massive step up for me. And when I was thinking about quitting permanently, my brain was like, we cannot do that. We can't do it. We can't do it. So that's something that we also work with, just changing the way that you are thinking about things. And that takes a little bit longer, but it's completely doable to change the way that you think about your addiction. But I also teach people how to become a moderators if that's what they want to do. The problem with that, or a problem is, is that you're gonna. It, it's it's not as easy as being abstinent. Being abstinent, once you get used to it, it's really easy. When you want to moderate, you will have to continue to do the work and plan and make sure that you follow your plan. So it's more work going into it, but it's not it's not impossible to do. So I always add that as an option. Like you can do it whatever way you want to do it. And we start where you are now and you can change your mind down the road. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you know how to do it and then you have the freedom to choose whatever you want to do, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. Because you what, what can happen is with intensive detox, people pay an extremely large amount of money like tens of thousands then they get put in somewhere for three weeks and then they're expected to be clean whereas mm. what you touched on is really important because it took maybe years to build up this addiction that's why I asked when do you think food addiction starts and I agree with you it, it brews in your childhood or your teen years or college years so so it could have been there for 10 20 30 years and to think you know to, you can rip it out in three weeks I don't think is possible and then it, it's all about money managing expectations and being realistic and this is where working with somebody like you is really important because a lot of people don't have that kind of money and they'll probably just relapse and feel so embarrassed and terrible afterwards whereas if it's a more sort of casual process where they work with you slowly somebody who's actually done it themselves and they don't feel like they have to do it tomorrow and and such like and they've got plenty of time and if they make a mistake it, you know it doesn't matter it, you know we're just moving slowly it's not sort of forced right you've got three weeks to get rid of this problem if you don't you're a really bad useless person because you've spent all this money on a big detox program so what are your thoughts on sort of that versus the long the long process versus versus the very intense process um i think a very intense process depending on what the drug is, can be very useful like to remove you from the environment and get you back to sort of a baseline. But the problem with that is that you're often left on your own after that and you're not equipped to handle that because you don't have a way to deal with your emotions and they're going to be all over the place after an experience like that. Mm. So it could be a good start. But when I have a client that is very black and white and they want to be, okay, I'm going to quit everything 100%. I know that they're going to fail because they put too much pressure on themselves. And if they like transgress the smallest amount of that, like it could be just like a bite of a cookie and the world is going on there. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, I'm screwed. I can't do it. And then they go on a binge and mm -hmm. it's always the same sort of pattern. So I like to like, just introduce a little bit of empathy <laughs> and self love yeah. in the process. Like this is, for your long-term gain we're not in a hurry any mistakes that you make along the way they are just information they're telling us what is not working for you and up until now you haven't even known what that was so we take that information we look at what happened we process it and we see what we can do better the next time you're in a similar situation and then you 
you kind of gone through it in your head. So it's almost like a visualization and visualizations are very useful because they, your brain can't really tell the difference between that and the reality. So when you start visualizing like, okay, what am I going to do the next time? So next time I'm doing this, then I'm going to do that. It's like you already practice it and you have already done it the, the way that you want to do it. So the next time you're in a similar situation, you're m- more likely to get it right. And if you're not, then we do the same thing again. Okay, what went wrong this time? Sometimes people need a few more times. It's not a problem. It's just a learning experience. It's more practice. And we just need to keep moving forward towards the goal that you want to have. So when people are falling off, I'm not saying that I'm happy about it, but I think it's really useful. And I'm more worried about the clients that I have that do really well and they don't fall off at all. And then we're coming towards the end of our period together. And I'm thinking they need to fall off soon because otherwise they don't know how to handle that when they're on their own. So I prefer that people make all the mistakes when they're with me and then we can correct it because that's how you become bulletproof when it comes to knowing what to do and building the confidence in yourself and knowing that you can handle those situations. Oh, no, that's really important because it is sometimes people will either relapse and then not tell anybody or me for two months. And by then, if they were mm-hmm. worried about their weight, they've gained it all back. And you just say, well, why didn't you tell me? It was like, oh, well, I was embarrassed. And I think yeah. a lot of people who say have given up smoking or whatever often had several attempts. And, and every single addiction has its own sort of patterns. And some people go back to the addiction sort of 20 years later and have to get, get get off it again so exactly as you said you have to learn what to do when it goes wrong and and it doesn't matter it's like I hope you enjoyed the um the donut you've done it now let's just sort of forget about it and start again and not have another 20 tomorrow but I think that's a really important sort of uh point uh about it doesn't matter and again being able to support somebody when it does go wrong because we are so terrified of failure and it's just inevitable in life and a lot of the what I've learned a lot is if you just get good at dealing and learning with failure you'll actually be really successful uh, eventually um so that's that's been really interesting so where can people uh find you what's your youtube handle um what's your website do you prefer to be contacted by email or instagram or uh, how's that how does that work and have you got anything coming up in the pipeline for people who might be interested like a webinar or a workshop or a new course yeah that's um so my youtube channel is probably the best or easiest way to find me so mm-hmm. that's just under my name name pim johnson and in all my descriptions, I always have a link that or links to it, all the other ways that you can contact me. But if you want to send me an email, you can send it to pim at pimjohnson.com. Um, I'm actually starting a new course uh, this weekend on the 25th in the US or 26th here in New Zealand that I call Coach Yourself to Success. So it's like an introduction to how, the coaching method that I like the self-coaching that I've done for myself for nine years and that I'm also using on all my clients. So that's sort of a an introduction to getting introduced to how I'm working. But I also have my group program if you're someone who just does well with instructions, you just want step to step, this is what I need to do and you can get on with doing it then that's perfect. And there's also some one-on-one coaching there, but you can check that out at pim at pimjohnson.com forward slash group if you want. Okay, great. So I'll put everything in the description anyway. And that's why I was yeah. asking because some people um, are intimidated by one-to-ones and other people don't like groups. So it, 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 if there's mm-hmm. something for everybody uh, and even just something like a taster for people to dip their toes in, that would be uh, really helpful. So thank you very yeah. much for coming on. It was really uh, interesting to listen to you and I've learned uh, a lot and I hope that people have um, got some insight now and some hope as well if you are addicted to carbs or food. Thank you so much for having me on. I do appreciate that.